So we have our new assembly line set. It's time to start working on more intricate parts of it. So we keep all of our parts in these containers, all of our reels. If it's an MSL two or above, so two or a one, that means it doesn't have to be stored in super low humidity like these do. So that means it can stay at any relative humidity under 60% for a year. But what happens if it goes above 60%? That means all of those parts either have to be baked, which you would have to remove them from the reel, or you throw them away. Throwing them away is not a very good option. Where in Florida, the relative humidity will be well above 60%, so we have two dehumidifiers and a mini split and soon to be a second mini split. But we need a way to know if it gets above 60% and we need a way to be able to track what the humidity is. So that's where this project comes in. We are gonna have a touch screen display that will show what the current humidity is and temperature. It'll be connected to a Wi-Fi module, which will connect to our Wi-Fi and will post to a server, our database, and then it can alert us if the humidity gets in a dangerous range and it can make sure we can track it to be able to show proof that these parts were stored in accordance with MSL levels. So the board itself is pretty simple. There's not a lot here. So what I'm gonna do is kind of design it more towards if it was a client's board and we were doing it as a job, kind of focusing it on like safety, making sure it's safe from ESD, working on EMC emissions, and just kind of going a little overkill, even though it totally doesn't need it. I think that might make it a little more interesting. With the boring background stuff out of the way, let's jump into the design. Instead of starting sequentially through the time lapse, I wanna actually start with the finished schematic just to kind of give a overall picture of everything since this is gonna go into a little more detail with some like ESD protection and filtering more so than I normally do. So I just don't want anything to get lost. So overall, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple layout we have the main microcontroller block, which is an ES ESP32, it's the Vroom 32D, which it's a module with a built-in trace antenna, which makes it easy, obviously, no uh, antenna design and it's FCC compliant. Directly on the microcontroller, there's a buzzer so we can sound an alarm. I don't know if we're actually gonna use that. It's controlled just by a standard NFET there's a phototransistor in a voltage in a resistor divider with a 220 ohm resistor. That's so when the lights are off, we can dim the screen and we're not just burning electricity for the sake of it. Uh, there's some filtering in here, which I will cover in the time lapse uh, programming header, the auto programming configuration for the ESP32. That's pretty common. It's in the programming and the reference design and throughout online. Over here is the main ribbon connector for the uh, 40 systems touchscreen that we're going to be using. On here, really all we're using is I squared C. So it's just powering the screen with five volts with a PTC fuse, SDA SCL, which are protected by an uh, an array of a TVS diode, which I'll, again, I'll talk about later. And that's pretty much it, just some caps on here. Then the humidity temp sensor, which again is I squared C. And then this gargantuan <laughs> block. So I'll cover it more in detail, but basically we just have some input filtering to make sure for this board, it's more so any noise that's generated on the board doesn't leave the board if this was going to be uh, subject to EMC testing. There's additional filtering on the input side of our buck converter because buck converters are noisy on the input, not the output. Then on the output side, there's a little bit of filtering with just a couple caps, but again, we have the inductor here, so that handles the majority of filtering. So there's kind of the big overview of the design. Now I think we can jump into the time lapse where I go into more detail on each individual block. So on this design I started with the microcontroller and once I placed down the microcontroller, the ESP32, then I did just the input supply. 
I didn't have any filtering from the start. I normally will save that for the end and the beginning kind of the layout is just kind of putting the main blocks in. Then I'll come back and fine tune it after. So once the microcontroller is on there, then it is the humidity and temperature sensor because that's kind of the core component of this. And it's an I squared C sensor. So here I'm making the schematic symbol and I've started to use the actual pin map uh, setup to make the pins rather than just adding them individually. I think it's a lot quicker. So once the sensor is on there, then I will do the uh, decoupling caps and then the labels for the I squared C. And what's nice about the ESP32 is you can in the registers map whatever peripherals to whatever pin so it didn't matter actually where the I squared C went. And then very important with I squared C, you have to have your pull up resistors or it won't work because all I squared C can do is pull low. It can't send it high, which is, or set it high, which is nice because you can work with different voltage levels, which is why I squared C does that. Then once that's taken care of this, like I said in the beginning, this is just the auto programming configuration for the ESP32. It makes it so you don't have to push down the reset button when you go to program it. It's really nice. It uses the uh, control lines on a UART, like a USB to UART, and it's in their data sheet. I didn't come up with this. It's what they recommend to use. You don't have to, you can just hold down reset, but you might as well. So now once we have our microcontroller and our sensor down, now is the ribbon cable for the touch screen. I use this in the uh, 3D printer heater enclosure. They're awesome screens, uh, kind of expensive. I think this one's like 50, 40, 50, 60 bucks, somewhere in there. But they're awesome. They have their own microcontroller built in, which can be completely standalone. It can be in a slave configuration or like this, it's a, it'll run code on its end, but it'll also talk to the microcontroller on the board, which is how I typically will use it. And with this, we have a two amp PTC fuse going off the board. Anytime anything leaves the board, I always will put a fuse on. That's kind of just my rule with everything. Cause if it were to short, it could cause bad things to happen on our board which of course we don't want. Um, and then I throw on a couple uh, 0.1 microfarad caps, one for each pin. They don't really set up the pin spacing on this board great, so it's kind of hard to isolate it to a separate ground and power pin, but I do the best that I can. And then after this, I throw on a TVS diode array on the I squared C which is super important with any peripherals that leave the board. This one, I know from experience, the 4D systems is pretty good with ESD protection, but it's still smart to have it. So basically, if there's anything on the board that is higher than what the TBS diode is biased at, which I think is around, it's 3v3 nominal, so it's around five volts, or it's five volts nominal, so anything that gets above that voltage is going to be shorted to ground. So if you have a really high voltage spike from your finger touching the screen and it gets coupled onto our board, instead of it going on the I squared C lines back to our microcontroller and frying our board, it gets shorted to ground, no harm, no foul. Um, and you see a lot of times people put bi-directional where it's a set of zeners backwards and forwards they're not needed unless you have a bi-directional line if there's a negative voltage spike on this the diode just conducts forward so you really don't need it so now on to the filtering for the esp again this is something that's overkill just because again i want this to be a board that would pass emc testing most likely so the most noisy components on this board are the RF emitting microcontroller and the buck converter. So that ESP32 is the highest frequency device on here. We're looking at anywhere from what, 2.4 gigahertz up to, I don't know if it has a five gigahertz band, 
But either way, we've got several gigahertz switching frequencies on that board. Of course, the module has filtering on it, but you can never take that for granted. So we kind of assume that the module on its power line is gonna be emitting some sort of RF noise on it. So the easiest way to get rid of that, especially at that high of a frequency level, is to use a LC filter with a ferrite bead. A ferrite bead essentially acts as a inductor, but it's a very lossy inductor in a specific frequency range. So as long as you choose a inductor that is, and when I say lossy, I mean it acts like a resistor in a specific band, any RF noise that would be going across that can't, it's blocked. So what this does is it keeps any noise from being radiated or conducted, because it's on a line, conducted from the ESP32 onto our 3v3 power rail, which on our 3v3 power rail, it could get coupled to anything else. And then in this case, worst case, it gets coupled to the main power input. And now we have our five foot cable acting as an antenna and you fail EMC. Um, I'm not gonna go into it too, too much because there's books and books on this stuff. But basically the biggest worry with a ferrite bead is you can get a bad resonance peak. So you need to make sure you have a decent bit of capacitance on the output side. And then for the uh, 10 microfarad, if you have a bigger cap, you want to make sure that you have a damper on it. So I do a RC with the one ohm resistor acting to give it a higher ESR, which helps reduce that resonance peak. So next I go to the input filtering, and for this I do kind of my standard uh, filtering and protection. So I'll have a PTC or sometimes a normal fuse, and I just realized that's a one amp, and on the uh, screen side it's a two amp, that doesn't make sense, because obviously the one would blow beforehand. But anyway, you have a PTC fuse directly on the input, and then you put a TVS or a Zener diode reverse biased past it, which helps protect, again, from any ESD issues or a reverse polarity event or an over voltage event. Any of those will cause the TVS diode to conduct, and then it will trip the fuse and protect your board. After that, I have a common mode choke which common mode chokes are used in a lot of boards, but you don't hear a ton about them, um, especially in like, like YouTube videos and stuff like this, but they're really, really useful. So they help stop common mode noise from getting across it. That's why they're called a common mode choke. And so basically if there's any noise that is on both sides of the choke, so on the five volt line and the ground line, this would be mainly from mains voltages, it stops it. It allows differential noise, so DC voltage, it goes in on the five volt, goes through your circuit, comes back on the ground line. It's only going through one in one direction at any time. If it's common mode, both going through it the same direction, it blocks it. It's because the windings are opposite, so they, uh, they impart a force which doesn't let it pass. And that helps, again, if we have any coupled noise from mains from acting as an antenna on our board. In this board, it's probably not necessary because we don't have our board going to anything else, but it becomes really important if you have a connected system and you wanna decouple it from any uh, AC sources. A good AC power supply, you really won't have an issue if they designed it properly but you can never take that for granted. So you wanna always do, do what you can. Again, in this board, it really isn't probably needed, but it's there in case we do need it. Next is the buck converter. Again, I'm not gonna to get too in depth with this just because it could be videos upon videos on this single topic. But the big thing you need to be aware of with a buck converter and then consequently a boost converter is you look at where the inductor is. So a buck converter, obviously the inductor's on the output side. On a boost, it's on the input side. The inductor acts to filter. It does a lot of stuff to give you the voltage regulation, but it allows the output side to be filtered and a 
buck converter and on a boost it helps to filter the input side. So with a buck converter dropping down the voltage, which this is, it goes from 5 volts to 3V3, the inductor's on the output side, so the uh, voltage ripple on the output side shouldn't be too bad. You don't have to worry about filtering that side near, that, near as much. The input side is where all the noise is because it's drawing, this is a 500K, 500 kilohertz buck converter so it is switching 500,000 times a second. On the input side, it sees that as drawing current, none. Drawing current, not. 500,000 times a second. So there's nothing there to smooth that out. So you wanna make sure you have ample filtering, what that might be. It kinda depends, you have to test, you have to simulate. But a good rule of thumb is just to have a few decades of capacitance. So a 10 microfarad here, two of them is for the actual bulk capacitance. Then the one microfarad, 0.1 microfarad, 1000 picofarads gives you the three decades of filtering because the lower the capacitance, the higher frequency noise, it's gonna help attenuate. You can also on here add a ferrite bead potentially, or ideally you could add a LC filter with an inductor and the inductor helps to filter out that noise. I didn't have it here because I'm pretty sure there's ample filtering on the input supply coming into the board, but you can add an LC to help cut down on that noise even more. Then I just clean up the schematic because of course you have to make sure your schematic looks good. Um, and then from there, the next thing I added uh, after doing the do not connects is a uh, buzzer. I don't know if the buzzer is actually gonna be used. My thinking is maybe if we're in there and the humidity gets high, it'll alert us, but it'll be texting to our phone anyway. So it's there if we need it. And it's just driven by a low power NFET because the buzzer itself is pretty, pretty low power. Then something important is a phototransistor, which just acts as a voltage divider when it's dark out not much current passes. When it's light out, a lot of current passes. So by sampling the pin where they connect, you can see what the voltage is. And that's so when it's dark and at the end of the day, we can dim the screen automatically without having to do it by hand, saving power. Then just adding the programming connector, I love using those tag connects, which is what this is, just the standard six pin adding all of the uh, UART stuff for uh, all the UART connections for the uh, programming header. And then I added like five test points just to be able to break out for uh, empty pads in case we wanna add something down the road. I normally don't do that, but there's so many extra pads here, I figured might as well. And then did a DRC check and everything came back perfect. So. That pretty much wraps up this board. Again, it was a pretty simplistic board overall design wise. That's why I wanted to add in the EMC side, uh, some safety stuff, ESD, just to make it a little more interesting. So let me know if you liked this style of video, if you'd like to see more of them or any suggestions or comments, I would love to hear them. And thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.